everybody. <laughs> um, so um, we're the International Socialist Organization. Um, and a number of us have been involved in uh, the fight against racism and police brutality, um, as well as the campaign on the death penalty, um, as well as um, other issues related to mass incarceration um, and anti-racism work in, in Rochester for a long time, for a number of years. And uh, what we want to do tonight, I think, is open up a discussion about um, uh, about police brutality that that looks at where this where these uh, where police brutality comes from, why why we still confront it, um, and why it's so concentrated in the communities that we live in. So um, so if you if you live on any side of the city, you know you, you see um, the, the massive police presence, and they, they 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 come in and they round up people and they clear the streets, um, and people don't feel safe in their communities. And I think what we want to do is try to begin to explain why that is, and um, with that explanation, try to try to try to come up with ways that we can fight back. Um, and you and and really, what I what I want to argue is what um, Michelle Alexander, who wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, um, uh, a couple of years, a few years ago, uh, that's that's begun to be uh, taking up uh, taking up a lot of these issues of systemic dis discrimination and mass incarceration, and um, you know things like racial profiling and all that. Um, I, I, I want to argue that's that's a useful way of actually looking at the way things are today. Um, so, and, w and what we confront is a, as a system of legal and cultural discrimination. So when we pull back the curtain and look at um, what our so-called colorblind society uh, looks like, uh, without affirmative action, mind you, um, we see a familiar social and political and economic structure, um, and it's a, it's a structure of racial caste, not unlike um, the old Jim Crow. We had a, we had a system that was uh, meant to keep um, people of color, blacks in particular, in a, in a, in a second, uh, in, a, in a lower caste, and um, we're treated as second-class citizens. Um, so what we're told is that the new Jim Crow no, no longer exists. You know, the, the old Jim Crow no longer exists. Um, that was done away with the civil rights movement, um, dismantled that, and what we live now, what we live in now, is a colorblind society. Um, racism is not a problem. We're still working out the tweet. We're still tweaking on the around the edges, but we don't, we don't live in a in a racial caste system anymore. And I would argue that's not actually true. Um, and those of us that live in um, cities all across the country um, that have to face police violence every day um, uh, are, are well aware that this isn't true. Um, so I, I want to argue, you know, where did the, where did the new Jim Crow? Um, how did how did it arise? Um, and I want to argue that it's, it's it's in the absence of a legal foundation for the subjugation of blacks. So the old Jim Crow had a legal foundation. Um, there was a written in the system of laws um, to for the subjugation of blacks. Um, and pro provided by the system of slavery in the Jim Crow, um, there was a new one that had to take its place. Um, and I, I, would, I would argue that this was, this was actually in response to an unprecedented um, racial solidarity that happened through the civil rights movement. And in the, in the later stages of the civil rights movement, um, in, the, in, the, in the latter half of the 1960s, it sort of um, morphed into a poor people's movement. So it, 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 was, it was beginning to take up all of these issues, not just, um, not just Jim Crow segregation, not just um, job discrimination, all these things. It took up a whole range of issues about poverty, about war, and Martin Luther King was leading, leading, the, leading, the, leading the charge in that. And we see through his speech about Vietnam how that was opening up a whole new set of issues for the movement to take up. Um, and that was a considerable, uh, considerable threat. So it was a movement that could absorb the political and economic demands uh, of poor and working class whites as well as blacks. So we had a movement that, that transcended um, that transcended the, 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 the legal and racial barriers that existed um, before, before that. Um, so in the civil rights most prominent leader, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, was proposing no nothing less than a radical transformation of the civil rights movement into a populist crusade, um, talking, talking about the redistribution of economic and political power from the wealthy elites to, to everybody else, those that actually make society work. Um, so I, 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 would, I would argue that this is actually panicked um, the people were panicked by this, this rapidly changing political atmosphere, and conservative whites uh, began a desperate search for a system uh, that, uh, of racialized control and, divi and the division of the white and black working class. So they, they saw this unification happening, and they said, you know, this is actually a threat to our power, we've got to cut it off somehow. So, and what, so one thing was clear, though, after the Civil Rights Movement, it cannot be, it cannot be spoken of in racial terms. So after the Civil Rights Movement, they couldn't say, you know, um, segregation forever. They couldn't say things like, you know, um, separate but equal. But they had to come up. They had to come up with a new language, a new way of describing the system, and a new mechanism for actually creating the same kind of society. But they had to call it something else, and they had to, they had to, um, they, had, they had to reform it um, to to accomplish the same goals. Um, and this is what Michelle Alexander uh, calls the new Jim Crow. Um, 
And, um, and I would argue that the, the new Jim Crow is actually driven by the war on drugs. So this is, this, that was their newest strategy. That was, that was a strategy that was born out of the defeat of the civil rights movement, the, the, the containment of the civil rights movement. We had black leaders that either went into the Democratic Party, and the most radical of the black, uh, the black movement was actually just killed off in some instances, like the Black Panther Party and all the, um, uh, and, and the, um, uh, the radical black organizations that were actually calling for something even more than just legal, um, legal rights. Um, they, 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 they were completely uh, uh, suppressed. And um, so, the, and the war on drugs is really the driving force of that. And and also um, to add, to to really get our discussion, um, to relate this discussion to what we're fighting in Rochester, the police are the front lines of the war on drugs. And this is this is I think the primary reason why we see so much brutality. Um, so the drug war has been absolutely brutal. Uh, we see they're complete with SWAT teams, tanks, bazookas, grenade launchers, sweeps of entire neighborhoods. Uh, those that and, and those that live in white communities have little, uh, little, little clues as to what's going on uh, in, in other communities. Um, and so, because this war has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, um, even though studies consistently uh, show that people of all colors use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates, um, this is not something that's exclusive to black communities. Um, in fact, some studies indicate that white youth are significantly more likely to engage in illegal drug uh, uh, dealing than black youth. Any notion that drug use among African Americans is more severe or dangerous um, is, is, is completely uh, contradicted by the data. And so what, what youth, for example, have three times the number of drug-related visits to the emergency room than their African American counterparts. So, and, and I want to highlight a couple more statistics um, that I think are worth, are worth mentioning. They're not, they're not new, but I think it's worth mentioning to, to, to keep it at the for, forefront of our minds uh, to show that, like, the, the incredible disparity that exists. Uh, first, there are, there are more African American adults under correctional control today in prison or jail on probation or parole than were enslaved in the 1850s, a decade before the Civil War began. As of 2004, more African American men were disenfranchised due to felon um, disenfranchisement laws than in 1870, the year of the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws that explicitly denied the right to vote on the basis of race. A black child born today is less likely to be raised by both parents than a black child born during slavery. The recent disintegration of the African American family is due in large part to the mass imprisonment of black fathers. If you take into account prisoners, a larger majority of African American men in some urban areas have been labeled fe felons for life. These men are a part of a growing undercast, permanently relegated by law to second class status. They can be denied the right to vote, automatically exclude, excluded from juries, and legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, public benefits, uh, much, uh, much the same as their, grandpa uh, their grandparents and their great-great-grandparents were uh, during the Jim Crow era. And right now we have approximately half a million people uh, that are in prison or in jail for drug offense, compared to around 41,000 in 1980. Four out of five drug arrests for simple possession, 80% for marijuana. Most people in state prison for drug offenses have no history of violence whatsoever. Uh, at the end of 2007, more than 7 million Americans were behind bars, on probation, or on parole. <clears throat> many, of those, uh, many of whose uh, initial violation of the drug laws spiraled into a life of crime. This is a, uh, a level of mass incarceration unprecedented in, in, in the U.S.'s entire history. And despite the fact that surveys show that whites are just as likely to use legal drugs uh, as blacks, one out of every 14 black men was behind bars in 2006. Uh, compared to one in every 106 white men. So we, I, I think it can be described in three separate stages. So the way that they do it um, and maintain this colorblind facade um, is, is in three separate stages. First, there's the roundup, which um, we, uh, there's the racial profiling, um, the, the, the sweeps of communities of color, um, getting people into the system, essentially. Um, and then there's a system of formal control, um, which once you get into the system, uh, as a defendant, you are denied meaningful representation. Um, you are pressured to plead guilty. Prosecutors are encouraged to load up defendants with extra charges and are protected from showing any racial trends in their cases. Prosecutors can also kick a black or brown person off a jury as long as they come up with any single excuse outside of race. Things like long hair or simply having a mustache um, if, is, 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 is okay. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a good enough reason to... Uh, so they have an incredible amount of discretion uh, and what they uh, and the people they can choose for jury for juries, and if imprisoned, uh, one can remain there for life uh, with numerous rights stripped away, 
um, including the right to vote. And in our last election, that was a big issue, right? Um, we had um, numerous states that were trying to vote, uh, try to uh, pass these voter um, voter uh, voter ID laws. Um, <coughs> but what going beyond the voter ID laws? For years, we've had um, we've had um, yeah, uh, voters voting rights stripped away from from um, anybody who's in prison. And we know who populates our prisons, right? Uh, you know who they vote for, you know. And so I think this is a, like a, a direct attack in a, a very systemic way of, of disenfranchising blacks across the board. And then we have the final stage, which is the invisible punishment uh, that we see after you get out of prison, after you've done your time. The punishment is legal discrimination through denial of employment, housing, education, and public uh, public benefits. And uh, due to post-conviction fees in some states, people are saddled with <laughs> tremendous debt and can have 100% of their wages legally garnished. Um, so imagine trying to rebuild your life um, after, after coming out of jail or prison um, under these circumstances. Uh, but I want to focus on the first, um, the, the first part, which is the roundup. Um, this, is, this is the thing that um, our movement right now is confronting, um, the, 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 the racial profiling. And I want to say that um, it is, it's, it's a common belief that police cannot stop and search someone without a warrant unless there was probable cause um, to believe that they, they were engaged in uh, illegal criminal activity. But this is actually not true at all. Um, but, the, so, but the Supreme Court, infected with a highly charged, uh, tough on crime atmosphere um, that came out of the 80s and continues today, um, through a number of decisions, has modified this basic right that is supposedly protected by the Fourth Amendment that bars illegal search and seizure. Um, this is known as the stop and frisk rule. Um, and um, it's known as the Terry decision, uh, named after Terry versus Ohio, where the Supreme Court actually um, uh, uh, proposes for the first time. So the, what is known as the Terry decision stands for uh, the proposition that so long as a police officer has reasonable, articulable suspicion that someone is engaged in criminal activity and dangerous, it is constitutionally permissible to stop, question, and frisk him or her even in the absence of, even in the, even in the absence of probable cause. So the, thing, the one thing that we believe uh, most of us believe is, you know, the one thing that's protecting us from police abuses um, just actually doesn't exist um, uh, legally. So we don't, we don't, um, we don't actually have that right. We have a lot of other rights, which uh, we, I think we can um, bring up and start to learn for ourselves. But we don't have that right. So when when the when the officer does do something um, out of line, the consequences are fairly light. Uh, an officer in the United States has not been charged with homicide since March third, nineteen ninety two, and we know that. There have been numerous homicides since then, um, what we call homicides, um, where the police have opened fire for no reason um, and uh, actually murdered uh, a number of uh, a number of people. And a lot of those cases have, have come to light in the recent in, in recent years. Um, uh, Marley Graham uh, in New York City. Uh, there's uh, in, in a few years back there was Sean Bell. There's Oscar Grant. Um, there's, there's these names. These names are finally coming to uh, finally coming to light, becoming part of our popular. Consciousness, much like Emmett Till was back um, as a, it was a rally, rallying cry for the civil rights movement. These names are our are, are rallying cry. Um, justice for these individuals and their families, I think, is, is critical. Um, and I would include in that Benny Ward as well. Um, justice for Benny Ward, I think, is critical for us in Rochester um, to, to, to win that. So, um, so for example, in, in Oscar Grant's case, um, if an average citizen had committed that crime, um, and did the con with the consequences, uh, the, the consequences would have been much worse. So the entire police department, essentially, it's not just the individual police officer that got, that got away with the crime, it's the entire police department that got away with brutality um, because there's an entire system of, of covering up and, and, and um, you know, this, this code of, this secret code of loyalty um, that exists. So in most circumstances, the officer that, who does wrong gets a slap on the wrist, uh, while any, any one of us who committed a similar crime uh, would receive time in prison, most definitely, especially if you're black. But I would argue that even when racial profiling um, doesn't lead to outright violence against innocent people, it creates a constant threat of danger mm -hmm. for men and women of color. The psychological effects um, that can't, can't be ignored. So we live in communities that are constantly in fear of being stopped and abused by the police. And the presence is always there. Um, and uh, and it's, it's unimaginable to think that um, in 2013 that um, people have to live in this kind of environment. Um, and, and the link between fear and crime um, and, and race uh, creates a formidable, I think, a formidable barrier uh, to unity. Uh, and the, the political and economic status quo is secure as long as poor people, working class people, people of color uh, in this country and other victims of the system are divided against each other. 
um, by by um, you know things like uh, by things like the, the police departments and um, this fear that that surrounds the issue of crime in this country. And as a socialist, I would argue that um, that that capitalism actually needs racism and breeds racism uh, because it keeps people divided against each other. It keeps the people in power um, uh, stay like, the people in power stay in power. Um, and, I, and police brutality is an integral part of uh, of that problem. And um, just to, just to, in a way of wrapping up, oh, we're not quite wrapping up. <laughs> um, I'll say that um, the, you know the, the like a broader issue that we're that we're confronting as well is like the devaluation of black life in this country. So you see, um, you know, so like the police aren't the only ones committing violence in this country. In, 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 they're, they're one of the main problems. But um, violence in communities of color, violence in black communities, is not addressed in the same way that it would be. In, in in other communities, uh, so I want to I want to I want to take a quote from uh, <clears throat> from uh, Kianga Taylor who wrote about uh, Hadia Pat Pendleton, uh, the young the young woman that was shot and killed in Chicago um, in, in in gang violence, and uh, the president President Obama actually went to visit uh, the funeral and it was just this big um, this big uh, state funeral I think or not state funeral but this big you know media uh, thing. Um, and she writes that the daily murder of black and brown children elicits barely a murmur uh, beyond the communities that endure it. The news media often lead with body counts from the city, the same way that they report on deaths in Afghanistan or Iraq or Pakistan. Uh, but rarely is there an effort to get behind the statistics and explore why hundreds of children are being killed within miles of where the president of the United States calls home. It's never stated but clearly understood. If 530 white children had been killed in, five year, in, a, in any five-year period in any city in the United States, it would be considered a national emergency. Yes. When white children die, it prompts press conferences, soul-searching, and demands for change. When black children die, it's, di it's dismissed as black-on-black -black crime and met with calls for more police or finger-pointing at black parents. So this attitude, this attitude of complete indifference to the struggles um, that people have to go through in, in our communities, I think, is um, part and parcel to um, the, this, the, 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 the rooted way in which racism pervades our society and our institutions. Um, and I just want to end with um, you know, what can be done about um, these, these things that we have to confront. And uh, I want to use the example of New York City, where, um, where a movement has actually developed in a very significant way that has actually um, got the attention of communities across the country. Uh, and, and so years of struggle has created a climate that has exposed the racist nature of stop and frisk, um, has shifted public opinion, and forced some politicians to begin to take a stand. Several individuals and organizations have conducted cop watches uh, to expose police wrongdoing. Coalition building organizations, including the Police Reform Organizing Project, Communities United for Police Reform, uh, and the uh, Sylvia Rivera uh, Law Project and Audre Lorde Project provided space and resources for communities to organize strategies and plan actions. Um, this is all happening within the, within the span of the last few years. They utilized every, every social media platform as well as petition drives, protests, and public forums in order to bring the issue of police accountability into mainstream discussions. There's been Know Your Rights campaigns, um, educational campaigns launched by the American Civil Liberties Union and the New York Civil Liberties Union uh, that took aim at police intimidation by educating youth on how to safely deal with police confrontation. And these organizations have painstaking, painstakingly documented the statistics on the stop and frisk program, exposing its racist nature with hard facts. Other organizations include Stop, stop and Frisk have utilized civil disobedience and organized protests, as well as distributed thousands of buttons to raise awareness about the program. And fierce protests, uh, most of all, outside the Bronx Supreme Court during the trial of police officer Richard Haste, um, who shot and killed African-American teen Marley Graham after raci racially profiling him, um, as well as uh, outside the, the Manhattan uh, District Attorney's Office. Um, and uh, it, it, like the, the activists actually organized huge rallies outside, outside the courthouse. Because um, we know what happens if you don't have that kind of support, if you don't have that kind of visi visibility. And there's been nonviolent marches um, led by uh, men members of Occupy uh, demanding, demanding the, re the, the resignation of Police Commissioner Ray Kelly and a, police, uh, a halt to police on uh, attacks on peaceful protests. Um, college campuses all across New York have been similarly, uh, have similarly become a hotspot for mobilizing and organizing against police surveillance and brutality with families of the, um, and, and this is, I think this is critical, with the families of the victims of police brutality and murder uh, touring 
um, have been touring the campuses throughout the city and college students um, getting involved in campaigns against police brutality. And in June, um, a, a silent march against stop and frisk for an interracial profiling drew some 15,000 people uh, pushing Mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg to back on his heels and forcing him to defend the program. Um, and so, so these are only a handful, <clears throat> these are only a handful of the many initiatives and movements um, that have taken place not only in New York but, but across the country. And uh, my hope uh, is that we can bring some of that energy um, and take some of the energy that we've built in Rochester to bring, a, to, to bring a similar movement that attacks the system on all these different fronts. Thank you.